Muy buenas noches y bienvenidos a, a Casa Árabe, a esta conferencia Migraciones en el Mundo Árabe, que es el resultado de la colaboración con el European Council for Foreign Relations, eh, a quienes les agradecemos eh, eh, enormemente el haber traído a estos eh, dos expertos, eh, Tasnim Abderrahim, miembro visitante del programa Oriente Medio y Norte de África del SFR, y a Tarek el Mashrisi, investigador sobre Libia del, del SFR. Este ciclo eh, o esta charla forma parte de, de un ciclo, eh, Diálogos sobre Sociedades Abiertas, que eh, Casa Árabe ha emprendido desde el, pres, desde el mes de enero eh, a petición del Ministerio de Asuntos Exteriores, eh, Unión Europea y Cooperación, justamente para explorar una serie de, de temas que eh, preocupan a nuestras sociedades eh, mediterráneas, eh, incluso Allende a, al al Atlántico también hay muchas de estas cuestiones interrogantes que, que nos interesa pues, dilucidar, por lo menos debatir. Mm, quisiera también bueno, ofrecer disculpas eh, por parte de mi eh, director general, Pedro Martínez Avial, que no pudo estar aquí eh, presentando es, esta tarde debido a una, a una enfermedad. Eh, el formato es eh, uno de los clásicos, eh, eh, hablarán los dos durante unos eh, 15 o 20 minutos eh, para después eh, les, les plantearé un par de preguntas y después eh, será el turno de, del público que tendrá la oportunidad de, de hacerles unas, eh, unas preguntas. Mm, primero una breve introducción. El número de personas que han tenido que abandonar sus hogares de manera forzosa sigue en aumento. Eh, según la ACNUR, la Agencia de Naciones Unidas, eh, especializada en temas de refugio. Eh, en 2008, eh, 2018 perdón, se alcanzaron los 68,5 eh, millones, casi 3 millones más eh, que en el año 2016. Esto nuevamente el alto comisionado de, de Naciones Unidas para los Refugiados. A ellos hay que sumarle a aquellos migrantes económicos que simplemente buscan una vida mejor allá donde la puedan encontrar. África acoge actualmente alrededor de un tercio de los refugiados y desplazados internos del mundo. Según Antonio Guterres, de, de, secretario general de Naciones Unidas, eh, los que deciden emprender el viaje a Europa se acaban concentrando muchas veces en los países del Magreb, esperando una oportunidad para cruzar el mar. La presión que estos países reciben por parte de sus vecinos del norte para controlar las salidas, eh, sumado a la falta de garantías respecto a los derechos humanos en suelo africano, han causado situaciones dramáticas como es la de Libia, en la que los sistemáticos abusos a los migrantes son conocidos ya en la comunidad internacional. En diciembre del año 2018, un informe de la UNSMIL, eh, la misión de apoyo de Naciones Unidas en Libia, recogió estas eh, violaciones eh, terribles, de, entre ellas torturas, eh, extorsión, eh, violaciones en grupo, y el enviado especial del secretario general de Naciones Unidas, Hassan Salame, calificó de fracaso nacional e internacional esta calamidad humana que tiene lugar en Libia. Ese mismo mes de diciembre se conmemoraba el 70 aniversario de la Declaración Universal de los Derechos Humanos. El informe de diciembre pide a la Unión Europea y a sus Estados miembros que reconsideren los costos humanos de sus políticas y los esfuerzos para frenar la migración a Europa. Y también eh, que aseguren una cooperación y asistencia eh, a las autoridades libias en base a los derechos humanos, en línea con las propias obligaciones de estos países, de la Unión Europea, eh, de los derechos humanos internacionales y el derecho de los refugiados. A su vez, los gobiernos de los países árabes del norte de África intentan maniobrar y sacar partido de las ansiedades europeas para conseguir... Eh, recursos y beneficios eh, para sus eh, ciudadanos, mientras intentan cumplir sus propios objetivos de seguridad. Lo cierto es que hay un gran margen de cooperación 
de ambos lados del Mediterráneo y es un buen momento para plantear alternativas o incluso un cambio de paradigma. En lugar de pensar en absolutos, fronteras abiertas versus fronteras cerradas, hay que pensar en cómo administrar estas, estas fronteras. Pero bueno, para esto están aquí nuestros dos expertos. Eh, sin más, voy a dar la palabra primero a, a Tarek y posteriormente hablará a Tasnim. Y pues agradeceros a vosotros vuestra presencia esta tarde en Casa Árabe. Needs to grow, and from my perspective, I think it's it's almost impossible to talk about local attitudes towards migration without also considering what European attitudes are and what European policies are, um, because I think, especially these days in North Africa, you can see an almost damning and, and very frank reflection of European attitudes and policies in North African. Um, policies, uh, attitudes by common people, and everyday occurrences. Um, and this, is this attitude of, of panic uh, towards migration, towards my, what migrants could mean for Europe, and this viewpoint of them as, a, as almost an existential threat to Europe, is not something that's new. Uh, it's something that exploded onto our TV screens uh, in 2014, 2015, But it's been going on since perhaps the early 90s when the spectra was first raised. Um, and if you can cast your memories back, uh, even on the Libyan viewpoint, you had the then uh, leader of Libya, Muammar Gaddafi, going to Rome and making this now infamous speech in front of the Italian parliament saying, all you have to do is pay me a certain vast sum of billions of euros and I will keep the black people out of Europe. And that is, in essence, the very frank and damning reflection of European attitudes, um, which I've mentioned in my introduction. But if we move forward, once again, 2014, 2015, the central migration route uh, up from the coast of Libya through to Europe, as that began to garner attention, began to trigger panic, um, the response was one of what you would call securitization. So how can we police these borders? How can we essentially build a wall in the Mediterranean? How can we stop people from traveling across? And this attitude was, I think, it, or it found its culmination in this kind of below the table deal between the Italian Ministry of Interior and some of the, the Libyan smuggling groups um, who are located in the northwest of the country where essentially they were given money to, to detain migrants um, in order to ensure that migrants themselves would not cross the Mediterranean. And I realized that just by introducing the subject like this, I might have gone over a lot of people's heads, 
So let me try and give a very brief introduction to the state of play in Libya right now. Um, following the revolution, the country has what you would call atomized. Um, so it's very difficult to speak of one nation, or one government that can rule over the nation. Instead, communities, um, local groups, local militias tend to police themselves, to pass their own laws, to run rampant over their local areas. Um, and it was in this chaos that people smuggling groups really found a home to operate. It eased the, the passage of people. It allowed prices to, to drop for an individual who wanted to be smuggled from West or East Africa up through the Mediterranean. Um, and it was this direct targeting uh, of these smuggling groups, um, an attempt to, let's say, bribe them even, um, in order to not allow further migrants to cross the Mediterranean, that has resulted in what many European policy offers, uh, officers, what many in European capitals now say is a solved migration problem. Because uh, if you look at the numbers of people who cross from Libya, following this deal, which was in towards the end of 2017, it's dropped dramatically um, from a height of maybe hundreds of thousands uh, to a handful of people. And you know, many pat themselves on their back and they say that the problem is now solved, um, even if not for the long term. But if we look on the ground in Libya, this had a really transformative effect. Um, you know, not only did the United Nations panel of experts who look into the conditions in Libya on an annual basis say that this deal likely triggered off conflict in northwestern Libya around the town of Sabrata, as many different groups of militias tried to position themselves to be those who, who benefit from Italian beneficence. Um, but it also radically altered the, the business model of these smugglers. So no longer were smugglers making, let's say, a thousand euros a head to take people across the Mediterranean. Um, now they were making money to keep them there, which meant that the more people they had, the more money that they make. Um, now Libya is historically, a, it's a migrant economy. Uh, many of your basic jobs, all the way up to highly skilled labor, are performed by migrants. Uh, Libya has a long history of working alongside its African neighbors. Um, but in this new arena, um, it resulted in something similar to what was broadcast to the world on CNN, uh, whereby groups of uh, migrants are now rounded up and sold to these same militias. Um, there's a story which was in that UN panel of experts report which best kind of captures the absurdity of, uh, of life for these migrants right now. Um, and you would almost laugh if it wasn't so horrendous that you had three men from Bangladesh uh, who gained work permits to come to Libya. They arrived in Metiga Airport in Tripoli. Uh, they were immediately kidnapped um, and traded to a people smuggling militia in the town of Sabrata. These militiamen phoned back their families in Bangladesh, they extorted more and more money out of them until they had effectively paid to cross the Mediterranean. And none of this came out until these three men were in a holding center in Italy. And the Italian authorities were asking them why they wanted to claim asylum in Italy. And all they could say is, we just wanted to work in Libya. Um, and I think that in a nutshell captures how, uh, how much the state of the country has transformed for those in it or those trying to pass through it. Um, you know, this, this kind of business model, the primacy of these kind of militias, it ripples through society. Um, <laughs> if you'd save the music for the conclusion when we have a solution, <laughs> it would be a lot more fitting. <laughs> Thanks. Um, but where was I? Yeah. Um, you know, when, when migrants are so much more panicked when they can't work in Libya anymore, then they tend to move around a lot more. Uh, and Libyan communities themselves, they start to grow more hostile towards them. Um, you no longer have the same family who's down the road and who's been working in the town for the last year or two. You have a different face every week. Uh, crime begins to be pinned on them. Anything negative which happens begins to be pinned on them. And so you see as well that the the hospitality um, which people once found in Libya also starts to wane um, alongside this new heightened and predatory business model uh, where armed groups will 
will prey on migrants and prey on those um, who are searching for a better life. Because just as a tangential point, we use this term migrant quite widely. Um, and I would say that a lot of those traveling are actually refugees. They have a legal right um, to go and to seek sanctuary, to seek safety somewhere. But as a rule of thumb, we tend to label them all as migrants, which, which changes our attitudes towards them. Um, and we have a scenario today in Libya uh, whereby, as I said, you have migrants, you have refugees who are all cooped up in these horrendous, hellish detention centers, um, which many European member states or the EU itself, they pay for their upkeep, if not in a very convoluted way, but they actually can't gain access to them. And the few reports which come out are really soul-wrenchingly horrible stories. Um, and through the International Organization of Migration, through UN Human Rights Committee, they've offered voluntary repatriations for those who were economic migrants and then realized, you know what, this is just not worth it, um, and want to go home. And, you know, there have been tens of thousands who have taken that. The logical progression of this is that those who remain in detention centers, the only people who would say that, you know what, I would actually like to stay in hell instead of going home, are those who are political refugees, um, who fear so greatly for their life that they would try to stick it out. Um, and so the fact that these people are forgotten and the problem is considered solved is, I think, quite a big stain on the European values that are often trumpeted out of Brussels. Um, and, you know, my colleague Tasneem will talk more about bilateral relations um, between European member states and North African states, but Libya, by and large, is very difficult to have this kind of formal relationship with in its current state. But where you do have them, um, it is quite a, uh, a one-sided relationship, whereby European states, foreign ministers, and interior ministers will come to Libya and they will talk about disembarkation platforms, um, which are essentially saying, we would like to build an enhanced center on Libyan soil whereby we can process all of these migrants, decide which ones we want to bring to Europe, and leave those who we don't. Um, and this is, a, this is a notion, it's a policy which is always rejected in Libya by Libyan politicians, by whichever Libyan they should wish to meet, and is roundly rejected by the population but nevertheless is trotted out on every European visit um, to Libya. And this, once again, creates an impression on the ground. I mean, the impression that many Libyans now see towards European policy, towards Libya, is that with one hand, Europeans wish to pay the very same militias who brutalize Libyan citizens on a daily basis in order to stop migrants and to keep migrants there. Um, and then at the same time, they would like to try and make formal agreements which will keep them there indefinitely. And you know, in some Libyan communities, you have the very same stories that you get here in Europe. You get a guy who's saying, well, you know, we're a village of 10,000 people, 20,000 people. We have almost 750,000 migrants um, in this part of the country. You know, if they stay here for a generation or two, then that changes the demography and everything I know about my home, um, which is a valid grievance to have. Um, but these resentments, they, they tend to, to snowball over time. Um, and, you know, especially when, when Libya is held up and Libyans are held up as kind of this example of, of everything wrong that migrants can suffer. Um, so, you know, you had the CNN report which came out last year, which talked about the Libyan slave trade, which hit on a really horrible point, but did it in a way which used a lot of false images, um, and fake news, as some people would say, um, in order to make that point. You have international superstars like Paul Pogba celebrating a goal and talking about Libya and how horrible they are to migrants. Um, you have news stories which come out talking about the horrendous nature of Libyan detention centers. And whilst all this is true, Libyans feel that it's unfair that they are being burdened with the blame for this, that they are being burdened with the responsibility for this when the very same people who are trying to stop, who, who are stopping them from forming a country, are also stopping uh, this issue from being solved. Um, and I think it's fair to say that Libya is 
suffered horrendously in the eight years since its revolution. Um, continuing war, the dilapidation of common infrastructure, over a lot of reasons. And you know, now we've gotten to the stage where Libya, which was once a donor country, is now having aid delivered to it, is now having development projects from Europe planned and delivered within it. And the majority of these projects and the majority of this money comes from what's called the EU Trust Fund for Africa. Um, so for a Libyan who suffered war, um, who had partners in the United Kingdom and France and the United States who told them that we are with you for the revolution and therefore afterwards, are now being told that, okay, we, we will help you to rebuild a sewage plant in Sebha, let's say, the capital of the south, but only if we can make a case as to why migrants will benefit from it as well. So every case, every piece of aid that they get, it has to involve migrants as well. And whilst nominally there is nothing wrong with that, it's something more that just builds at the resentment inside and that builds in this hostility that we're not worthy of it, only the migrants are. Um, and you know, this deeply unhealthy relationship and dynamic, um, the saddest thing about it perhaps is that it doesn't really have to be that way. I mean, I've described to you today what has stopped the numbers of migrants going across the central Mediterranean route uh, from getting to an all-time high. Um, to me at least, to many other policy makers, it doesn't seem like a very solid solution. Um, if people smugglers thrive off chaos, they thrive off the lack of a rule of law um, in order to operate, then surely the only medium-term or long-term solution um, and the only real partner you can have in Libya would be for a stable Libya and for a Libyan government who you can work with. Um, but for as long as migration is always the, or migration policy is always the cause of a reaction from the latest crisis which comes about, instead of a forethought policy which extends 5, 10, 15 years into the future, then we will continue to see cycles. Um, the problem itself will never be solved. It would be what engineers call patched, um, and patched again and again and again. Um, so I will end on this point and just say that if those who plan policy um, and who deal with migration uh, will not just look at the numbers of today and call the problem solved, but will look at the drivers of, of migrants, will look at what creates and propels this phenomenon, um, then perhaps we can all start moving to a real solution which involves partners on both sides of the Mediterranean working together in a humane way in order to protect the humanity and the decency of those who do cross across Libya um, and across the Mediterranean. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Tarek, for, for this uh, first impression. Uh, I'm sure we will go back to to those uh, ideas where you imply that this doesn't have to be this way and what are the possible uh, ways out or, or solutions or areas where something, you know, a change of paradigm or something else can be explored. And uh, I'm sure there will be more questions also on a few things you, you mentioned. But let's give way to Tasnim Abderrahim and hear what she has to say first. Tasnim. Thank you, Karim. Uh, first of all, I would like uh, to start by thanking ECFR and Casa Arabi for hosting us today, and thank you very much for uh, this great uh, audience this evening. I hope you all enjoy the uh, discussion. Um, so, um, I am happy to talk about migration, which is um, an increasingly important topic in EU-North Africa relations. I mean, here um, it's clear in, in Europe, I mean, the importance of uh, migration as a topic in the political and public debate. But as Tarek was also mentioning, migration is an increasingly important topic uh, for countries in, uh, in North Africa. There is a changing regional landscape. There are, um, the countries are changing from not only uh, countries that send migrants and that act as transit points, but also incre increasingly uh, receiving new uh, arrivals, which is especially felt in Algeria and, and Morocco, especially that uh, Libya that used to offer uh, jobs for, for migrants from Sub-Saharan Africa, uh, the situation there is changing, it's no more able to play the same role. So this is um, impacting the whole uh, regional landscape. 
And this changing regional landscape actually since 2011 has uh, made the EU turn towards more, even more cooperation with the, uh, with the, with the, with the neighboring countries. After the EU-Turkey deal in 2016, which led to significantly uh, reduce uh, crossings on the eastern Mediterranean route, the focus moved uh, to Libya and the central Mediterranean route as uh, Libya accounted for over 90% of arrivals in Europe in 2016 and 2017. Uh, that, of course, talked extensively about the situation there, but I would like to go uh, to the point of the release of the CNN report in November uh, 2017, which, uh, which show, showed some migrants that are being sold off uh, in kind of slave auctions in, uh, in Libya. In, in that same month, in November 2017, there was the, uh, the African Union, European Union summit that was organized in Abidjan later that month. And du during uh, that summit, the question of the, uh, of the migration, of the migrant situation in Libya took center stage. And the, uh, the different actors there, the African Union, the European Union, and the United Nations decided to, uh, to find kind of a joint response to the situation there. A joint task force between of the UN, the African Union, and the EU uh, was formed. And they identified a number of objectives, as Tarek mentioned, the repatriation of uh, migrants to their countries of origin, uh, finding temporary resettlement for refugees who were, uh, who were transit who are transferred to uh, a temporary transit facility in Niger till their uh, till like permanent resettlement is found, and and another objective was to close the detention centres. Uh, both the uh, of course the informal it was not possible to uh, to even identify them in the first place, but to close the uh, the official detention centres. Talks started with the uh, government of national accord in Libya to establish kind of a, uh, an open center that would be co-managed by the government of national accord and between the uh, and by the IOM and the UNHCR. Uh, there was strong resistance, as Tark mentioned, by the government of national accord. Uh, in the same time, so there was a difficult situation in Libya, decreasing crossings from Libya, but also increasing uh, crossings on the, uh, on the western Mediterranean route via Morocco. So what happened uh, in, in early 2018, there was this idea to find a regional response to disembarkation. So they said, okay, fine things cannot work in Libya, the situation is very complex there, even if the government of national accord accepts, it will be hard to really establish a functioning open center there, so we can think of other safer alternatives, be it uh, Tunisia, Algeria, or Morocco. And then in, in June 2018, uh, in the EU Council uh, meeting, there was this proposal to establish regional disembarkation uh, platforms in, in North Africa. Now, the proposal was quickly abandoned because there was outright rejection by all countries in North Africa, from, from Morocco to, to Egypt, who, who, who saw that the proposal just was not realistic. And the rejection was based on practical and political considerations. Practically, the countries, as, as, as Tarek, for example, mentioned for Libya, there are concerns about migrants staying bottled up in the country for long periods without any prospects for their repatriation to their, uh, to their countries of, uh, of origin. Uh, also, in, in, be it in Algeria or Morocco or, um, or Tunisia, also there is a growing anti-migrant sentiment. So to what extent this proposal could actually be accepted by the local uh, population was, uh, was questionable. Uh, and politically, the countries just so that they, they, it's not their uh, responsibility to host uh, large numbers uh, for, for undefined periods uh, of time. And they saw the proposal as kind of undermining their sovereignty and as kind of uh, treating them as subordinate to Europe or as implementers of, um, of European uh, policy. So in the EU Council meeting of uh, September 2018, and in the face of this rejection, the, uh, the European leaders said, okay, maybe regional disembarkation platforms um, is not really necessary to solve the migration issue, but what we can do is to try to work with countries of North Africa on other areas of, uh, of common interest and basically to work more on border management and uh, work on readmission. 
So for, uh, for border management, now it's, it's, we can say that it's kind of a shared area of interest because, because now if we look at, uh, at Algeria, for example, Algeria was receiving significant numbers of uh, growing numbers of sub-Saharan Africa, of, of sub-Saharan uh, migrants, and, and also like the migration, uh, like the movement of the migrants is changing. Like before, it's not new that Algeria is receiving migrants from Saharan Africa, but they used to stay more in the south. In the past few years, they became more visible in coastal cities. And this kind of triggered uh, a response by, by, the, uh, by the Algerian population that was demanding the, uh, uh, the, the government to, to address this situation. Also for Algeria, security considerations are, are of utmost importance, so, so they, they just didn't want to be turned into, into a smuggling hub. The approach was, uh, I mean, how they handled the situation and thousands of migrants were, uh, were pushed to the, uh, to, to the Sahara and they concluded deals with Niger and, uh, and Mali to send back um, the migrants. And there was kind of backlash, like the Algerian embassy was, um, was, uh, was uh, attacked, was a small attack by, uh, uh, by, by migrants in, uh, in, uh, in Mali. Um, and for Morocco also it's the same, like the country does not want to turn into a, s a smuggling hub. Like Mor Morocco has uh, actually uh, become destination uh, country, they have their own migration strategy, they have regularization um, uh, poli uh, regularization uh, policy or campaigns also in uh, in place, but they still do not want to uh, uh, to be receiving um, significant uh, numbers, especially of uh, uh, of irregular uh, arrivals. And then on, uh, but, but okay, so so there is a mutual area of mutual interest, but this does not mean. Uh, that North African countries are willing um, to, uh, to cooperate with a whole range, range of European uh, proposals and mechanisms to bolster uh, border management. Uh, again, I can give an example of this. For example, uh, the EU wants to convince uh, Tun Tunisia and Algeria to join the Seahorse Mediterranean Network, which is kind of communication platform to facilitate communication between border authorities in, uh, in Italy and, in, uh, and between North African countries. Uh, both countries are hesitant to join the, uh, the network. Uh, same, things for, uh, same thing for Frontex. The EU wants to conclude uh, working arrangements with, uh, uh, between Frontex and uh, all of uh, Tunisia, Algeria and, uh, uh, and Morocco. Again, there is no clear interest from these uh, countries. Like Algeria was uh, uh, immediately said, no, we are not interested in this. Uh, Tunisia is kind of hesitant and saying, okay, let, let, let's still look, uh, look into this. But in general, there is, no, uh, there, there is lots of, of hesitation to engage with the whole uh, range of uh, EU uh, mechanisms for, for border um, controls. Um, now on migrant return. Like migrant return has been a constant also area of cooperation between the EU and North African uh, countries since the, since the 90s. Uh, many uh, countries, uh, many European countries concluded bilateral agreements with countries of, uh, of North Africa. And, and usually uh, countries in North Africa say, yes, we are willing to admit our own nationals. We know it's our legal duty. Um, and we are willing to do that as long as we can identify uh, our nationals and issue their, um, their travel documents. But in general, the implementation of these commitments has been quite, uh, quite mixed. And, and on readmission, the, the countries differentiate between two things. There is the readmission of their own nationals, which they are generally cooperative on, but there is the readmission of third country nationals, that is migrants who transit through North Africa to reach Europe. And, and all of these countries, actually be Tunisia, Algeria or Morocco, they are resistant to uh, and, and willing to, to, to return uh, this, kind, uh, this, this type of, uh, of migrants already in the negotiations on a readmission agreement uh, between the EU and Morocco or the readmission agreement also between the EU and Tunisia. The, this point has been uh, quite controversial and, uh, and has blocked the progress uh, of the, uh, of the uh, negotiations. Now, um, 
migrant return is increasingly important for the EU. The EU is in the process of uh, developing, developing an efficient and coherent uh, policy on return. And uh, and actually one of the, uh, of the ways for the EU to enhance the cooperation of, uh, of third countries on return is by linking it more closely to the visa dossier. That is, for instance, for countries who will be uh, unwilling to cooperate on return, there will be repercussions, implications in terms of uh, visas. So in the proposed uh, reform now, which is, uh, which is still uh, being discussing, discussed in, uh, in, in Europe, for instance, if a country is, is not cooperating enough on the return of its own nationals, uh, the EU with member states will have the, uh, uh, the, the possibility of, uh, for instance, denying the issuing of visa to diplomats of these countries in a way to, uh, to pressure them to cooperate more, or it can be through uh, a stricter application of visa restrictions, like uh, extending the, the time needed to process a certain visa or increasing the fees. So the EU is trying to kind of establish a stronger link between, uh, between visa and, uh, and readmission in order um, to push, um, to push uh, these uh, objectives. And, uh, and on, on, on readmission, there is the bilateral, the existing bilateral agreements, and the EU is trying, and the member states are trying to. Uh, now there have been a series of visits. Uh, Merkel has been to Algeria, where the Algerian government said, "We will, we are committed to return the plus the 3,000 Tunisian, uh, sorry, Algerian irregular migrants in uh, uh, that, who are in Germany." Uh, there was a visit by Salvini to Tunisia also last year, where he wanted to increase the weekly quota of returns. Uh, so there, there are like bilateral uh, efforts to, uh, to increase returns, but at the same time the, there are uh, readmission agreements that are being negotiated between uh, uh, the EU and each of uh, Morocco and, uh, and Tunisia. Um, so far the negotiations have not uh, progressed for several reasons. Um, there are, for example, um, there is, for example, uh, an EU proposal like in the draft agreements to on what, what they call laissez passe that's a document that a member state can issue to facilitate the deportation of a migrant if, if, the, if the country of origin does not respond within a certain deadline. So, the, uh, the, of course, Tunisia and Morocco said there is no way for us to accept this if a national is proven to be like of our country, then it's only the, our national authorities that can issue their, uh, uh, their uh, travel uh, documents. So, and the discussion is still ongoing. Here also is the same thing for uh, Spain and Morocco. There is um, uh, the question of the significant number of uh, Moroccan uh, minors in Spain. More, uh, Spain is trying to find also uh, ways to, to, to work with the, uh, with the Moroccan uh, government on their um, return. But overall, I mean, we can say that migration will only continue to be uh, important in EU-North Africa relations. And what we see also is there is growing linkages between the different dossiers. So migration is no more kind of a standalone issue. It's more interlinked with uh, development uh, assistance, with uh, uh, with trade, and it will be like useful for every side to kind of focus on mutual areas of interest and and try to avoid turning this topic into kind of toxic uh, topic in the relationship. Like for the EU, it needs to shy away from proposals that can that cannot be cannot be realistic and not be implemented in North Africa. Well, also North African countries need to realize that there is. Um, increasing numbers of departures of their nationals and uh, work more on, on, for, for on their return, but also on the, uh, on the improvement of socioeconomic uh, conditions that continue to trigger um, this movement. I will leave it there. So um, just before handing the, the microphone over to the, to the public, I'd like to, to ask uh, each of you um, a couple of questions. So um, Tara, you mentioned the, the, the panic. Uh, it's sort of like you started by saying there's panic in Europe, and at the same time you also said that, uh, that there is a change uh, or a, a big impact in perceptions uh, amongst Libyans who also feel that you know, their, their country is unfairly asked to do 
to bear the brunt of this of this uh, you know uh, migration trends uh, without being given uh, you know the instruments or the tools either to to deal with it so uh, I mean how would you work with those perceptions what what is what is to be done is do you think there is any campaigns of also information besides the the obviously correction of some of the of the policies because there is clearly something wrong also with the with the perceptions with the way people are perceiving both um, uh, uh, migrations from north to south of the Mediterranean but also uh, sorry from south to north of the Mediterranean but also within you know the the, the Maghreb the, the Maghreb there's also very um, uh, dark uh, uh, perceptions over the, the sub-Saharan uh, uh, people in, in Libya. And number two, I think there's, uh, there's always this curiosity of, you know, there's, we speak about the EU or we speak about the AU, the African Union, yet uh, there's, uh, you know, I guess member states that are much more um, involved in pushing for some specific policies. And you both have mentioned Italy. So I don't know if you could sort of like explain a bit, you know, what has the Italian role versus other member states in, in this, uh, in this uh, sort of like since 2016, where there's been this, this, this change. Mm -hmm. um, well, thank you for the, uh, for the interesting questions. Um, this first one on, on how to change perceptions. I mean, I started off by, by talking about how European attitudes kind of set the tone for what then become Libyan attitudes. And you're right, this, this element of panic, this perception of people as an existential crisis and as a cause for concern, you know, it's only natural that somebody in Libya says, well, if they think about it this way, shouldn't I be concerned about it too? Um, and I think that in the, the chaos of the last seven or eight years, it is something that was allowed to slip and that you know, people really couldn't get a good grasp on. Um, but I think more, more recently, a lot of the agencies who are working on migration, such as IOM, um, are actually doing some good work in this field. Um, and I think they've managed to identify more than just the kind of background noise of what changes these perceptions some of the more tangible factors. Um, I mean, look, you can't, or I at least can't sit here and say that, that racism um, towards sub-Saharan or darker-skinned Africans doesn't exist in Libya. Um, it does, but at the same time, you know, it's not something new um, for Libyan communities to have significant proportions of sub-Saharan Africans to live amongst them. Um, and there is a, a healthy relationship there. Um, and I think it's just this natural human, human condition of, you know, if somebody lives down the road from you and you know them, you know, you know who they are, you know where they work, they've been around for the last six months, a year, you inevitably feel more comfortable with them. But in a state where everybody is panicked, um, where trust is a very rare commodity, and where you have a house down the street, where you have five new faces that you see every week, um, and then the stories start to go around, oh, this guy was robbed, it must have been from those Africans who were here last week. Um, then these are the things which start to deteriorate the trust that's there between people and that start to get uh, people more fearful. So on a national level, I think the only step towards, towards trying to fix this is, more, is to regularize those who are already there. Um, but then also to try to make more efficient systems and protections at least to get these people into Tripoli because it's hard for the government to, uh, to exert control outside of the capital. But I think if you can set a standard in Tripoli, then perhaps that can then be replicated elsewhere. Um, on this question of the roles of different member states, you know, I'll, I'll try to be slightly diplomatic at first and and say that, I, you know, it's, it's kind of unfair because we all talk about Italy, 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 and it makes them perhaps come out as the, the big bad wolf in the arena. Um, but, you know, for many years, they reached a stage, and I think it was 2015 or 2016, I'm sure Tasneem will correct me, where you had almost 100,000 people a month in the summer months um, who were just being offloaded onto Italy. 
Um, Italy felt alone to a large extent. It brought the case towards Brussels. Not much was done uh, beyond Operation Sophia. They felt that the French and the Austrians and their neighbors were closing off borders in order to keep migrants in the country. Um, so they felt panicked and they felt like they had to do something. Um, but I think that now that this initial panic is over, uh, they've applied the patch for better or for worse. Um, people are starting to sit down amongst each other that European solidarity is coming back out and they're trying to find a more consensual role um, between all those who are most concerned about migration. So that includes the Spanish, the Italians, the Germans and the French. I hope that answers it. Thank you. Um, Tasnim, you, you did... Um you know, speak about these areas of, of mutual of mutual agreement, um, and where you know even you, you did mention that um, migration could be used uh, or or um, um, incorporated in in sort of like things such as trade or areas such as trade. I wonder how exactly you you think this this can be structured, um, and uh, at some point you also. Um, agreed that some of our of, of the um, uh, countries from the Maghreb have similar positions. Uh, both Morocco and Tunisia did this specific action. Both Algeria and Morocco agree. So, do you think there is any case for thinking of a uh, joint position, as in a proper uh, regional cooperation, at least of these three countries? Um, on the first point, on the link between uh, migration and trade, uh, actually what I meant is that uh, the discussions on migration is increasingly linked to the, migration, to the discussion on, on trade. Where we can see that, that like, we know that uh, the EU is uh, negotiating a deep and comprehensive free trade area with each of Tunisia and Morocco. Now, and also at the same time, these countries are, are, uh, are negotiating double agreements on readmission and visa facilitation, so both Tunisia and Morocco also. What, what the EU is doing is linking the negotiations on the readmission agreement and the visa facilitation agreement. So for a country to get a visa facilitation agreement, they need also to agree on certain things on readmission. That Tunisia and Morocco don't like that. Uh, that, that linking, and, and but, but they understand, of course, the motivations for the EU. So they're trying to play kind of the same game by linking the negotiations on visa facilitation with the negotiations on the trade agreement. Like, for instance, for Tunisia, and same thing actually for Morocco also, they said, okay, so we'll have this uh, deep and comprehensive free trade agreement, uh, which will provide for, um, for the freedom of movement of, uh, of goods, but can we speak of the movement, freedom of movement for goods without freedom of movement for people? So what they're trying to, to do is to, to get more uh, concessions from the EU for visa facilitation, not for everybody. They know, of course, the EU will never accept that. It's not realistic. But for certain uh, categories of uh, professionals, you know, who are, who, will be, who are involved in the services uh, sector and who will be covered by the, uh, by the trade, like that the sectors that will be included covered by the, by the trade agreement. Um, so the, the response from the EU has been mixed so far, uh, but now negotiations, talks with Morocco are, uh, are frozen in any case because of the uh, political um, situation. Uh, but in Tunisia, actually, in the last round of negotiations, which was, I think, it was in October, November 2018, there was a joint delegation by DG Trade and DG Nir who visited Tunisia to see uh, possibilities to see that linking. So there are no promises so far, but still there is kind of a beginning of, uh, of thinking in, in, in this direction. Uh, for the second point on countries of the Maghreb and joint position, I wish... But <laughs> I wish I could be more optimistic, but, but realistically, it's, um, it's very hard, I think, to see a cooperation between um, countries of, of, uh, uh, of the Maghreb, uh, and, and, and especially on, on the migration dossier. Maybe we can see cooperation between, uh, or coordination between Morocco and Tunisia, uh, but especially between, because of the situation between Algeria and, uh, and Morocco, it's, it's very difficult, actually. And especially on the migration dossier, like both um, countries have been defining their, um, their policy on migration in relation to the other. Like, for example, when there was the, 
Actually, in the summer of 2017, um, there, was, uh, there was a campaign on social media in Algeria under the title No to Africans in, uh, in, in Algeria, which is basically to complain about the presence of irregular arrivals in, uh, uh, that are begging in big cities in, uh, in, in Algeria. Uh, of course, that was faced with a counter campaign, which is saying Algerians are Africans, to also remind Algerians of their uh, belonging to the, uh, to the to the to the to the same uh, continent. But also around the same time, uh, Morocco was uh, on, announced another regularization campaign for uh, for for the migrants. It's it's always like trying to 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 hint, you know, more because Morocco has. Uh, has developed a coherent migration policy and has uh, programs for regularization, has programs for, uh, for the reintegration of migrants. So it's way developed, it's most developed actually in, in North Africa in terms of, uh, uh, of dealing with the new, uh, with the new uh, arrivals. And they're always like hinting to, to, to the lack of progress in, in Algeria in that area, which of course the Algerian government um, doesn't lack. So actually as, as a topic, migration itself is kind of uh, causing some tensions, you know, and malaise in the relationship. So I think it will be um, uh, very difficult to see, uh, to see uh, kind of joint positions there, except, except if there will be increasing uh, European Union, African Union, uh, dialogue on migration. Probably in, in that case, it will be in the interest of North African countries to have to develop kind of uh, a joint response and, and uh, joint position on the issue. Thank you. Bien.